Welcome, strangers far and near. It is good to be with you on a cold, windy day with a little less snow than we had last time. Just want all of you to know how welcome you are. If this is your first time to participate in a church here in this place or at all, we are very sincerely honored to have you with us. This series, Jesus for Outsiders, has me on a weekly basis making a plea for any outsider of faith, outsider to Christianity, to submit questions and comments. Because we are looking closely at Jesus for outsiders. Now, I'm not surprised that I have not heard from any outsiders, right? Because even this invitation is being offered on our own turf, right? inside of a religious service, inside of a Christian space, whether that's online or in the person. So I'm not surprised that I haven't gotten much in the way of outsider comments, but still I am hearing from folks. In fact, some, uh, an insider said, you know, maybe, maybe people might be offended by the term outsider. Now, that's a pretty good thought, right? If you label someone as an outsider, is that going to make them take some offense or be angry that they're considered an outsider? Well, I don't know. I mean, it could go either way, right? If you treat someone as an outsider, label them in that way, they might just be indifferent to it because they're not connected at all. It might be one more thing that might be used to say, well, I don't want anything to do with those people. I think it depends upon the experience that one has. Perhaps some outsiders to Christianity, outsiders to the church, wear that status as a badge of honor, right? Maybe they grew up in the faith, were connected to church, and then decided, I want nothing more to do with that. So sure, call me an outsider, because that's who I am, that's what I want to be. Now as I thought about this series, As I poured into the Gospel of Luke, I will tell you that I thought about a lot of different terms of what to call it. Outsiders, uh, uh, Jesus for outsiders is what I settled on, but I thought about strangers, a word that I used just a little bit ago, someone unknown to Christianity, unacquainted with Christianity, uh, a guest, um, someone that is unfamiliar with Christianity or the things of the church. A foreigner. Now, I probably like guest maybe better than some or unfamiliar because it's, it's a little more positive. It doesn't just put someone in a negative category. I have categorically stayed away from terms that have pretty much fallen out of usage, pagan and heathen, <laughs> right? I mean, those have fallen out of of use for really good reason, because what you're doing by calling someone a pagan or a heathen is you're making a decision on how connected they are to the world religions. Are they a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim? And if they're not one of those major world religions, then they're a pagan. They're a heathen. They're on the outside. Plus, in popular term, we tend to call our kids heathens, right, if they don't (laughs) use silverware. So it's not very much a complimentary term. I even thought about irreligious, which is definitely a descriptive term. And yet, if you use the term irreligious, someone might say, well, wait, I think of myself as religious, just not in the Christian sense that you think of it. So irreligious didn't work, and I settled on outsider. Now, my aim. My aim in looking at Jesus for outsiders, I've told you two of them. One of them is just that I want to be able to tell stories about Jesus, and to do so providing extra background, extra information, defining terms, because sometimes we insiders don't realize the terminology that we use that might just by the use of those terms, keep people outside, keep and prohibit them from an understanding. So Jesus for Outsiders is an attempt to tell those stories in a way that can be relatable. Well, a second aim 
that I've stated before, is that I want all of us to know that Jesus is for outsiders, that Jesus cares about outsiders, and to look at those stories that reveal Jesus being for outsiders. Well, there's one thing that until now I haven't shared with you as my purpose. I've kept it because I've wanted to communicate that all of us have and share outsider status. Whether we think of ourselves inside the Christian faith or outsider, all of us share that status as outsiders. And our story today is going to hopefully provide insight to that in a way that maybe others cannot and have not. So, we're looking at this man, Jesus, a Middle Eastern Jew who lived 2,000 years ago in the country of Israel, who had a number of claims made about him, that he was the Son of God, that he was the King of all the Jews. Some of these claims are a little bit more difficult than others for some to accept. For example, saying that he's the Son of God is a claim that's kind of difficult to accept. Or the claim that he rose from the dead back to life is a difficult claim. I'll tell you today that those two difficult hurdles, they're not on our track today. We're not going to be jumping over them. We're on a different course today. As we look at this Jesus character, we don't have to look just in Scripture to find out that he existed. We could look, as I've mentioned before, at the Jewish historian Josephus, or the Roman senator, whose name was Tatius, or uh, Mara, a Stoic philosopher, or even Suetonius, a Roman historian. These are, our pe these are all people outside of the Christian faith that give reference to an indication of the existence of Jesus. And there are many, many others. It's not a scholarly leap to say that Jesus lived. He did. It doesn't take a big leap. It takes a bigger leap to say he was son of God or that he rose from the dead. Though the fact of his existence and the fact of his execution is something that is established in history. Now, for our purposes, we've been looking at a biography. A biography written by an outsider, someone who wasn't an initial follower of Jesus, someone who didn't grow up in uh, the faith quite like those early disciples and those early followers, early apostles of Jesus. And so, when we look at this story of Jesus, I'll remind you that Jesus has just been on a backpacking adventure, minus the backpack, minus having any food at all, 40 days out in the wilderness where he was tempted and tested. He had been baptized and was full of the Spirit. After his uh, temptation, he's full of the Spirit. And now, Luke, our outsider biographer, tells us what his first acts are, public, for everyone to see. So I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles to the New Testament, to the Gospel of Luke. And you can find out where that's at, either in a table of contents or by just Googling Luke 4. And we're going to start down in what's called a verse, which is down from those big numbers. That's the chapter, number 4. We're going to go down to the little numbers to verse 14, where we'll pick up today. I'm going to invite everyone, if you're able to, to stand for the reading of Scripture today. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. And a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. And he began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free, 
to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, and he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and they began, and then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him. They were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth, and they said, Is this not Joseph's son? The word of the Lord from the Gospel, Luke. I'll let you find your seat again. Thank you for standing with me as we read from Luke chapter 4. Well, this is quite a story. Uh, Luke starts us off by giving us a bit of a recap. He's covering a lot of ground. So he gives us the recap that Jesus is full of the Spirit and that his reputation is spreading. It's going everywhere. People are quite interested in this guy from Nazareth, his hometown. And he has him come back amidst of all this buzz to his hometown to launch his ministry. And we figure out pretty quickly that he's a pious Jew. He goes to what's called a synagogue, which would look a lot like this. A place of gathering where a community would have at least 10 men, so 10 families. A place where they would gather for the public reading of the Hebrew scriptures. And then there would be teaching. Now, Jesus' custom was to, to go to church, to go to synagogue. It would be something like church. And no doubt he knew all of the faces. He's looking out at family and friends and people that had known him for a very, very long time. And we get a description that is a description that kind of stands alone of what it's like in the first century to go to synagogue, to be given a scroll, a massive scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Now, today, some of you have probably been to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, you can go and you can see a complete manuscript of the prophet Isaiah. It's the oldest and most complete manuscript of Isaiah that we have. It's from 125 BC. So that's almost a, a, a century and a half before Jesus died. And this scroll, you can look around, it's, it's posted on the wall, there's pieces of it that are 24 feet long. The whole thing, with just a few exceptions. So we get Jesus being handed the scroll by an attendant. He unrolls it. He finds a passage in Isaiah 61 and Isaiah 50, and he reads it. And he rolls it up, and he goes and he takes his seat where everyone can see him. All right, those details are helpful because we learn what a synagogue service was like 22,000 years ago. And we wait for Jesus' words. And Luke gives us one line. Today... This scripture is fulfilled as you hear it. And they go crazy. They go crazy for their hometown son. They knew him from the time he was a young little boy. They, they'd seen him grow from youth to adulthood. They knew Jesus. And the word is, hey, isn't this Joseph's son? And they're excited. Who wouldn't be excited? Now, it's surprising to me at how, what a great beginning this is. I mean, it, it, it seems a lot like the staging that we would do when a high school senior signs a letter of intent to go and play ball at a particular university, right? All the cameras are there, they're in their hometown, lots of cheers. Or, or when a candidate goes to announce their candidacy and they go to their hometown and they have all of their supporters around them. The home team advantage is clearly on Jesus' side and they are cheering. They are excited about what he's done. Now, he makes some significant claims that don't turn them away. He claims that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. He claims, without blinking, that he is anointed, he is king. And they support him in that. No one is upset about that, no one's turned away. He even says, I'm on a mission from God. And my mission from God is to preach good news, to, to set the poor free from poverty, to set captives free, to give the 
sight to the blind, to bring the downtrodden up, and everyone is excited. And the story continues. Now, a lot of times in church, that's where it stops. In lectionary readings, they quit in verse 22. So I'm going to invite you to stand again and hear the scripture as it's read, picking up in verse 23 through the end. All right, we can hear the cheering going. They're all excited. And he said to them, doubtless you will quote me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we've heard that you've done in Capernaum. And he said to them, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah. And then the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine in all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except for a widow in Zarephath of Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha. And none of them was cleansed except for Naaman the Syrian. And when they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. And they got up and they drove him out of town, led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through them, through their midst, and went on his way. The word of the Lord from Gospel Luke. Okay, what happened exactly here? I'm a little bit confused and lost. This, he was, everything was going so well. This, this teaching message didn't just fizzle, it blew up. They became a mob that thought of him as an insider, but they were ready to drive him outside. He now had outsider status. They were going to shove him not just out the door, but over a cliff. Now, I don't get it. They weren't repelled by his strong claims to be the Messiah, to be the king of Israel. They were okay with that. And they had been hearing about Jesus. They'd heard about the things that he'd done in Capernaum. Translation, a non-Jewish town. And they heard that he was coming home and they were excited and they were ready to see Jesus again live and in person and let Jesus do and say the things that he had done and said elsewhere. They were ready. But perhaps they hadn't heard about some of the things that happened privately for Jesus, right? They hadn't heard about the temptation where Jesus was tempted to take the easy route, to use his powers, like I mentioned last week, like video game cheat codes, to use those divine powers to feed himself, to use his powers to take a position of authority instantly, to use his powers to be called and labeled the ruler of all, right? He was tempted to the easy way, to jump from the temple and get easy accolades. And here was his chance. He probably could have jumped and they would have just carried him. They would have crowd floated him. He could have body surfed all over that synagogue. It would have been amazing. But they hadn't heard that he had turned away from that kind of approach to what it means to be the Son of God. They assumed that they had insider status with Jesus because of it being his hometown, because of them being Jews. And they were ready, whenever he challenged that, to turn him inside, outside, and over a cliff because of what he said to them. Okay, but what happened? Well, what he did is we learned something very important about the nature of God from how Jesus uses Scripture. He uses Scripture in a way that is not afraid to offend insiders in order to serve outsiders. Because sometimes that's the way God's grace works. Sometimes God's grace is offensive. Now that's difficult for me. Because, you know, it's fine for me to hear Jesus use scripture against the devil. 
to turn away the temptations, right? Okay, that's fine. You use Scripture on the devil. We get it. That's good. But you use Scripture on me? Oh, wait a second. And here is exactly what Jesus did. He knew that they wanted a sign, and so he brought up Scripture. He brought up the story of Elijah. Elijah had the chance to go and feed anyone, but went to a particular widow who was not a Jew and stayed with her and let her experience a miracle of feeding that never stopped. And Jesus takes the jab and he says, and there were many widows who were hungry in Israel, but Elijah went to her. And you can feel the seething. And then he brings up Elisha and says that Naaman, the leper, there were many people in Israel with a skin disease, but Naaman, the leper who was a Syrian, Jesus goes to him, or uh, Elisha goes to him and heals him of a skin disease. Do you see what happens? The moment when they get upset is whenever scripture is used to point out their insider status, not privileging them. It's a marvelous story. It's a marvelous story of God preaching the good news that God reigns. A message that is for all, for insiders and outsiders. To release the poor, to release the captive, to set people free from blindness, to bring up those who are downtrodden, to do what is just and fair. Well, the difficult thing is how to do this. How to live this, how to believe this today, because it gets very uncomfortable. I mean, if we look at this story, what we see in this story is what happens when religious people get mad. When they get mad and upset, when they have equated their own view of the world with God's view. What we see is what religious people do whenever disagreement means it's time for you to die. That's pretty stunning. It's a shocking, shocking story. And frankly, I'll tell you, it's really hard for me to compose, to think about how to take this sermon to the end. It's very difficult because it forces all of us to identify, to ID those people that we lack sympathy for. Who are those people in our lives that we just do not have empathy for, that have a different perspective than we do, who are a part of a unique group. Who is that circle for us? And it's going to be different for different people, right? I could say some things and it wouldn't fit for everyone. Some of you have a very difficult time identifying with someone who is living on welfare, who's living off the system, because we look at them a little sideways. Some of us have difficulty looking at a homosexual because we just don't know if that fits in our understanding of God. Can I take it further? Maybe who's on this list for you? Is it a supporter of Trump? Is it someone who speaks something against Trump? Is that who you lack empathy for? Right? It starts to get very uncomfortable. When we make this list, is it someone that might be black who's asking for a fair treatment that they can't get? Or do we lack empathy for, for a white person who will not listen, who will not entertain that there is any kind of racism in our country? Do we lack empathy or sympathy for those insincere Christians or is it just all Christians in general? Let's just lump them all in there. They're all worthless. We don't want those Christians. Does it take naming denominations that are not our own denomination? Churches or countries or our competition, our business competition? Now that's difficult, right? We can nod our head and say yes. Now you have to get in your own heart and think about who it is that you lack empathy and lack sympathy for. In this story, it's very clear. Who are you willing to kill? 
Wow. I mean, that's what happens in the story. They go from almost worshiping this guy to being ready to kill him. That's a big, big shift. Killing a child of God. You know, that's tricky because that's definitely a lack of understanding for an outsider. Well, it's hard to bring up these things, I know. And you'll forgive me, but they're on all of our minds. At this point, it's very easy for us to sit back and denounce the Capitol riots, right? Who who would not want to do that? Well, yes, terrible. Denounce that. But what about the kind of thinking that inspires and motivates that kind of action? What is it that pushes us to the brink of being willing to kill? Now, here's what I want you to think about. This is, see if, try this on and see if it works for you. Because as I think about this, I think, who would I be willing to kill for my own belief? That's, that's pretty strong. To think about killing, whenever you were to kill someone, it means you are protecting some place where you feel threatened. It means you're wanting to attack someone else and you're ready to do away with their life. So really, killing is a self-interested move, right? There's also a move of defending someone else, of being for another. And that's where you risk yourself, because you're not getting anything out of it. The interest is not self-interest, it's on behalf of others. Do you see the difference there? Between killing that's for my own opinions, my own beliefs, and saying, you know, this person needs help. I'm going to stand for them, even though it's of no personal benefit for me. Which one of those is more Christian? Which one of those is more in line with the way that Jesus carried his life? If we're going to take our gospel, our gospel of good news for poor, for the oppressed, for those who feel like there is no voice for them, what does that look like? What does that look like for us? In terms of policies that we support, laws that we vote for, things that we press for in our own Albuquerque community, what does that look like? Do we care about not just our medical needs, but somebody else's medical needs? Do we care not just about our kids and how they are educated, but how All kids are educated. Do we care not just if our pipes burst in our house, but for those that have houses where it's a common occurrence because there is no foundation under there. The air whips under there. Do do you see what I'm saying? Do we care for outsiders? Because this gospel is good news for all. The first Christian, we're a group of people that follow Jesus. That's what we want to do. And a text like this makes it very difficult because we are soaring over the cliff with Jesus, not defending ourselves, right? Uh, I think Jesus must have had supernatural powers as a preacher. You know, these are not the kind of sermon texts that I want to look at. Jesus, I think, had supernatural power to say, no, this is not the time I'm going to die. It's going to be later. It's going to be a different kind of lifting up. It's not going to be a falling down. But here at First Christian, we follow Jesus, being with Jesus wherever he goes, doing the things that Jesus did, imitating them, saying and speaking the things that Jesus said, and going, going into those places where Jesus leads us, that are new for us, that are uncomfortable for us, that push us to the very limit. So I leave you with this. Think about what Jesus is for outsiders. Think about who it is in your life that you right now lack a whole lot of empathy for. You just could care less about them. Your list, it's going to be different from mine. It's going to be different from the people that are sitting next to you. And then think about, how are we going to live this gospel out? What is it going to look like For this to be good news, not just for me, but for all.
Let's pray. God, we thank you for being a good God. It's hard to imagine a synagogue service, a church service, quite like this one that Jesus was a part of. The whiplash is unbelievable. Father, would you help us? Would you help us to be so drawn to you, to so focused, to be so focused on your leadership that we want nothing more than to please you? Thank you for all the things that you've shown us in Jesus, even difficult things like this, the willingness to lay down our lives for others. We pray for the coming of your Son into our hearts and into our lives. We pray for the coming of the Spirit into our lungs and around our beings. We pray that we will know that we are children created of you through Jesus who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen.